Summers. I'm the president of the Rotary E-Club of Florida, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome um, our speaker, Jerry Graybeal, who's the principal at Wildwood Middle High School. Um, he'll speak to us today uh, on response to challenges in education during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, just a little bit of uh, background about Mr. Graybeal. Um, he grew up in the Northwest Mountains of North Carolina and received his uh, BS from Appalachian State University in 1988. Uh, he was teaching in North Carolina and then uh, moved to Florida uh, where he became a high school teacher and athletic coach um, in 1998. Uh, he received a master's degree in education and uh, he has spent 23 years in Union County, Florida as a teacher, coach and administrator. It's his seventh year now in Sumter County and the second year as principal at Wildwood Middle High School. So welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um... It's always good to talk about our school and, and the good things that our kids are doing that a lot of people don't get to hear about. And uh, the times that we're living in, everything seems to be negative coming from education. And so many states are shut down still completely. But uh, Florida's been one that's kind of been cutting edge and we've made our own way. And we have been ahead of a lot of other districts around the state. Uh, one thing that helped us when the pandemic hit all of our students had laptops at that time. We're a one-to-one -one school, one-to-one -one district. Uh, every student in this district has their own laptop. So when we had to go all of a sudden to virtual learning, uh, it was not that difficult for us compared to what a lot of districts were facing. We were able to roll it out and uh, Yes, it took a little getting used to over the first couple of weeks, but our teachers adapted to that and the students adapted to it. And we made the best of the situation. When this school year started, we probably had about 60% of our kids who came to brick and mortar settings to start the school year. And we had the other students who were either under a Team Sumter approach where they would take online classes and have a physical teacher you know, before them online every day, one of our teachers, or they could do the uh, Florida Virtual School where uh, they were kind of on their own in their academic setting. Um, after the first nine weeks, we gained a, a few kids back. After the second semester, which ended last week, we gained even more. We've got less than 100 kids now that are still on the Team Sumter uh, learning system. And, uh, you know, and, and they seem to be making adequate progress doing that. We always want them back here as quickly as we can, but uh, we understand that the situation that everybody's facing. Um, the things that have been tough for the kids is when this came about last year, uh, you're missing out on athletics. Those were shut down in the spring. Uh, kids missed out on the prom and uh, those seniors, we were able to hold an outdoor graduation. We did a drive up, almost like a drive in theater, uh, whereas a lot of schools only did it virtually or whatever. Uh, I wanted our kids to be recognized. We had the stage set up. We had members from the district office and Superintendent Shirley there. And uh, we, the kids were able to exit their cars, come forward, cross the stage, receive recognition, scholarship recognition at that time. And, and we held, a, you know, we, we even uh, broadcast it live on Facebook and things. So we had about as normal a graduation as you can, other than kids having to drive up in cars. But it was pretty neat to see and a, a big event to pull off. And it was successful. And a lot of people were to thank for the things that they did to help set that up for us. Um, this school year, then what's it faced? We were, you know, we had athletic, we've had athletics right from the beginning during football season. One of the first big things that comes up is homecoming, okay? Are we going to have a homecoming dance? That's not in the gym anymore, you know, uh, or it couldn't be this year, but we decided to have it out at the football field to limit it to uh, a certain number of kids. We didn't allow our middle schoolers to come to it this year, but we had a DJ set up. We had social distancing, uh, kids had to wear a mask. And at least it, after the football game, it gave them a couple hours to uh, have some normalcy because we wanted to provide as many things for these kids as we can. Uh, we're now in the process of, of planning prom and uh, we have a, a site picked out for that that will take place May 8th. 
getting the dress code formulated for kids right now. And uh, so we're just trying to get things back uh, as much normalcy because they've had to face a lot. No students in the existence of schools, well, since we've known them, have had to face quite the, the things that they faced. And uh, being cut off from friends and, and those types of things and just that uh, communication, social communication that they missed out on. And uh, I think they're glad to be back and enjoying what we've got going on. Um, talking about athletics at this time, our girls basketball was one of the top teams in the state and in 1A and the boys are too. The girls won their first district tournament game last night, 73 to one. Uh, so that was a pretty good thing. We'll be in the district championships tomorrow night. And then uh, if we're able to win that on to regionals next week, the boys have had a, a successful year. They started out a little slow because of football being extended and the number of athletes that play two sports. So uh, they're one of the top teams in the state and looking to do well. Their district tournament starts next week. As far as academics here at school, one of the big things that we're touting is we have a Cambridge ACE diploma program. A lot of schools have advanced placement. And, and when I took over as principal, we had not been successful here with advanced placement courses and those types of things. We wanted something unique to Wildwood that our kids could take pride in. And uh, we met with district and this is, we, we came up with this, it's through Cambridge University in England. And this ACE diploma program is a very intense uh, thing for kids to where they take advanced courses. Uh, if they are able to pass the end of course exams through seven of these courses, uh, they earn a ton of money. They're pretty much entire college is paid for. So we're in the second year of this program. We started out last year by teaching, having offering marine science and uh, general paper, which is an, an English language arts thing. This year we added environmental management, computer science and history, as well as psychology. We have a global perspectives class that is research-based that is be, being offered next year. As long as, as well as a different English language course. So these are very intense things. The kids are loving the program so far because it's unique to us. This isn't offered at South Sumter. This is totally a Wildwood thing. Now, some other counties, I know some of them in Marion County, uh, North Marion has been very successful with this. But like I said, it gives us something to be proud of. Uh, these kids also have to complete 100 hours of community service and uh, it, it's just a, a four-year labor-intensive thing for those that decide to go into it. And uh, that's where we stand with that. Like, like I said, something that's new to us. Um, we have about 800 kids here normally and uh, when, when everybody's back and uh, we are 6 through 12. And that, that makes for a unique situation as well because of you know, distancing and those types of things and trying to keep kids separated the best we can. But we're limited because we do have lunches where kids have to be together and only so much space. So, you know, we've done the best we can. And actually, compared to the other schools in the district, we have fared well with our COVID numbers and those who have had to be out. Uh, that's a constant thing that goes on from week to week. Actually, every day the, the district sends out an exclusion list. The, those students were faculty members who have to be quarantined at that time and for how long. Those, those names are coming from the health department. Uh, most of this, about everything is run through the health department. If someone's been in contact with someone, they do the litigation tracing and they'll have us do some. But uh, so that's a daily fight. I could in the next hour have three or four teachers that have to go home. We had that about two weeks ago. We lost five teachers within a matter of 10 minutes that had to go for home for a week period. So, and we're already limited on subs. So you, you just never know when that's coming. It did, we were able to pull different uh, paraprofessionals to cover those classes and make it through. It's just a constant battle and uh, something we've never seen before and I hope it gets over quick, so. <laughs> but uh, we want all our kids here to be successful. And uh, 
Wildwood is a unique place. The first year I came here, and this is my oh, sixth year at the school. The first year I came, I did all the discipline by myself. And I thought after that first year, I, I could walk away. It was just, uh, I bet we had 2,700 discipline referrals that first year. After the first year, we took it down to 1,300. These kids long for love and attention. They're, they're great kids, and a lot of them don't have much away from here. This is their life, athletics, school, their friends that they have here, the teachers that uh, love them and put an arm around them. For some of the kids, negative attention at least is better than no attention. And uh, you hate to say that, but that's what they face. And uh, so we've tried to do a change in culture here. And, uh, we're, it's just a constant battle to try to get kids doing the right things at, at all times. And just hoping that the things that we instill in them will take them to where they will want to go on and further their education, further their careers. Um, I was talking about the ACE program earlier. We also have a big CTE offering here, career technology. Our agriculture students, I gave out 15 certificates this morning for those who had earned landscaping industry certification and passed a rigorous amount of tests, in, including plant identification and those types of things. So that's something we're proud of. Our nursing program, medical program is always doing great. And uh, those students will be testing on industry course certification as well. Same thing with business. Next year, we're looking to add a, an HVAC and electric course uh, to where these students can, in collaboration with Lake Sumter State College, leave here and, and either be admitted there or have a job in the field awaiting them when they come out of high school. So that's something that we're, we're taking the old automotive lab and, and reconstructing it, getting rid of equipment and moving new equipment in for that program next year. And uh, the district was uh, given a $150,000 grant just last week for that project. So, so those, are, those are some good things we've got going on. Do you guys have any questions? Well, thank you so much. It's amazing to hear about how flexible you've had to be. And, you know, I'm sure even under the best of circumstances, running a school, uh, you know, with, with 800 kids with all their personalities and, and uh, you know, et cetera, is, is, is a tall order. But under these circumstances of the pandemic, it's even more challenging. So thank you for sharing. We got, we got good people around us, good staff here in the office and, and things and teachers who have just done an amazing job. I couldn't ask any more of them. I mean, they've had to face things that they never thought they would face, but uh, it's not always been easy, but they've endured it. So mm -hmm. proud of them. Yes, I think we can all be proud of the educators. It's, uh, yeah, definitely uh, difficult times. And I know, um, yeah, for the students too, having things like the homecoming and the prom, it's the graduation ceremony, those are some of the key you know, experiences in their lives that really help them with their mental health, as well as, um, you know, overall self-esteem and, um, right. Yeah, having those community experiences. But let me turn it over to the uh, others in our in our group. So we had some people joining us a little later. Uh, I think you, you could all uh, see this is our uh, speaker today, Jerry Graybill from the Wildwood um, School. And he was just talking about some of the challenges in education during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are some of our other uh, Rotary Club members and, and guests. So anyone have questions for uh, Mr. Graybill? Yes, uh, this is Dr. Owen, and I am here at Charity and Love in Orlando, Florida, the Rosemont area. Let me pull this off so you can hear me better. I, did, I don't know if you heard it. Um, Dr. O and um, Barbara Answer at Charity and Love in Orlando, Florida. I was an educator and uh, had administrative degrees. Uh, my concern is the testing and preparation each day to uh, evaluate the kids and the staff um, coming in with all the asymptomatic um, conditions. How are you checking everyone knowing that you have asymptomatic, meaning no fever, nothing, and 10 days of, of no symptoms before someone shows symptoms? How are you looking at that situation um, and knowing that you have people there that are possibly totally asymptomatic, but may be carriers. 
Well, that's a, that's been the tough thing for us. When we uh, when the kids co come on campus in the morning, as they report to first period, uh, each teacher has been issued uh, scanning thermometers. So the, the temperatures are taken as the kids enter the classroom. The uh, classrooms are disinfected after each period as far as the desks and things within them. Uh, hand sanitizer is located outside every room before the student center. We have to weigh heavily on the things that we get from the health department and, and, and all that. I mean, we may, I may get a call today, hey, my student was at church and exposed to somebody there. What do we do? And uh, we have sent their, you know, we, we get them in contact with the Sumter County Health Department right away. It's was, it was worked great with us and uh, have left a lot of that in their hands as far as the tracing and things like that. And um, like I said, I don't know how we've been fortunate. I thought we've uh, sometimes we get some negative attention. I said, good Lord, we'll be the first school to have 100 out, you know, but uh, I don't know how we've been fortunate here compared to some of the other schools in the district with the number of kids that we've been lucky not to have out that have been quarantined. I think right now we're, we're at two students and two, two staff members. So. Yes, Linda. Yes, welcome, Linda. And yeah, I think you have a question. You're on mute. Yes, there you go. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Mr. Grabiel, I apologize. I tuned in after you started speaking, so I may have missed whether you addressed this or not. How many of your students at Wildwood Middle High School are doing virtual school now as opposed to coming to the building? I don't have the exact number. If I had Miss Crosby in here, I know we're under 100 now out of 800, so we have 700 kids back on campus. Uh, we started out the year about 59-60% of kids that were actually on campus with about 40% away. So we've dropped that down quite a bit. And uh, we are also required now for any student that is doing the virtual education, uh, the Team Sumter approach, if they have a D or an F, uh, we have to meet with those parents uh, every few weeks have the parents sign a consent letter. I understand my student may be struggling, but I still want them to remain in the team center. That's, you know, a parental option. And uh, we've been going through that process lately with getting those letters signed and letting the parents know, you know, we would rather have them here, um, but this is a decision that the parent makes. So. Yeah, um, I, I live in the villages, so I'm, I'm well aware of Wildwood Middle High School, um, and we've actually in the past had some, some working relationship with you all. Here's my concern, and, and you might ex address it not just in the context of your school, but in education during the pandemic in general. Um, I'm a retired educator. I was at the university level preparing professionals to work in schools, um, not specifically teacher prep, but we were related to the education program where teachers were being prepared. Back in the day, it was quite clear that teachers were being very well prepared for teaching in a classroom and not prepared at all for teaching online. They were taught to use online resources, but not using um, the virtual medium for instructional delivery. Um, this is really troublesome to me. Um, at the university, before I retired, I was involved in developing online courses and, and training faculty in how to teach online. You don't just pick up your lecture and drop it into, into a virtual environment. So my concern is the ways in which the schools have helped teachers do the very job that they have been tasked with. And the second part of that is how badly are teachers going to be slammed in the long run because kids have lost ground. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's kind of a, a multifaceted issue. Right. But my concern is for those kids who are doing virtual school and your population at Wildwood is a classic example. 
They may not have access. They may not have support at home. Um, and it, uh, compounding all of that is that their teachers may not really know what they're doing in the online environment. So could you, could you address that a little, please? Yeah, and, and I hit a little bit earlier. I think we were fortunate um, when all this happened that all of our students had uh, their own laptops. Every student in, in this district is issued a laptop. So, and that, that was the case last year when this first came about. Uh, we have a great IT department here within the district who provides constant training to teachers in all areas of, of online use and computer use and trainings and things. And they also have somebody from the district office here almost every week uh, that is available for teachers with new apps or anything that they want to be trying online with suggestions. But uh, there's just constant trainings within this district for our teachers. So when the pandemic hit and we had to go online, our teachers were pretty much ready. Now, it, it was something different to get the kids and to, to learn how to do some of the things, but they knew what to do. Um, because we spent about uh, the week when this first hit that kids didn't come back and they were out of school. We had just come off a of spring break. So the kids had been out and then they didn't return after spring break. So that first week, our teachers were in training here, even though they were coming back to school for a few days before they went out. And uh, they were in constant training too, as far as how to access kids and rosters and those types and how to teach online. And uh, students were aware of how their assignments would be turned in and one note and those types of things because that training had come from the district. Excellent, so I thank think, you so you much. Know, compared to a lot of districts, we were way ahead. Uh, number one, by having the resources, by having uh, one-to-one -one devices, but also the training that's constantly provided here in this district for the teachers. Um, you, all, you all should be held up as a model. Um, I know many districts are not, not that well covered. Um, I'm delighted to hear that, that that's the situation at Wildwood. Thank you. Uh, Yes, ma'am. I think we were one of three districts that started back the, the first week that online was available when this came down from the state and all. There were three school districts. I don't remember the other two that started right away, but we were ready to go. And, you know, two and three months later, a lot of the districts were still complaining. We can't do this. We don't know how to do this. Oh, we, we were at it. I can't say it was perfect from the get go, but uh, we were ready to go with it. And, uh, and learned along the way those, that first little while. And that, that's why I said when we started this year and we still had some students on it, it's become kind of a seamless type thing. And, uh, and, and we've made the best we can. What I think sometimes can be more difficult for some of these teachers, we have teachers that are doing swivel classes. They may be teaching within the classroom while at the same time they're doing online with other kids. So that's not an easy thing because you may have the distractions from somebody online that the kids in the class are seeing or a kid at home may be having to deal with the distraction in the classroom here. So that's tough too, but uh, they've done pretty well with it. And, uh, and overall, you know, I, our kids and masks, I didn't know how we would react when we came back to school this year. You know, are the kids going to book this or going to, is it going to be a constant battle for us everywhere we go? But I got to admit, they're, they've done a great job with the masks and those types of things. They know that people are looking and want them, you know, point the finger at somebody. We didn't want to be one of those schools on Facebook or YouTube where somebody's walking down the hall video and then there's 100 kids without masks. So, and that took place in other school districts and other states. You would always see something like that. And uh, we did not want to be an example, of, a negative example in any way. We wanted to be a positive one. Are you anticipating uh, the academic slide that we're hearing about so much? Are oh, you seeing that with your students? It's happened, yes, yes. Uh, you know, you've got students who probably excel in the, in the online method. Mm -hmm. 
more so uh, you'll, you'll always have some like that some are better in the brick and mortar setting we would rather have them here but there are certain kids that you know learn better that way but I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that we didn't lose ground and kids didn't lose ground when this when this hit I don't think we did so much this year as we did last year and just uh you know, there was no state testing last year. Uh, there will be this year. And, uh, you know, they're going to be pointing fingers when those numbers fall and, and, and your pass rates on your end of course assessments and those types of things aren't as great. But uh, it's just something we're going to have to see and deal with. And even teachers last year did not have uh, their evaluations done. So that because uh, the student scores are always uh, – factored into the teacher evaluations and a, a percentage of, of how they grade out for the year. So, Back in um, the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I was doing distance education, international distance education. And, and that was basically before Al Gore invented the internet, I say. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was both in um, Orange County Hospital homebound and then at... Um, international universities. And uh, it's interesting that I offered uh, my background in history when this hit the very first week and they started implementing it here. Um, and the, I offered it to the school board um, leader and she sent me to the vice, uh, the assistant superintendent in charge and he kind of blew me off. And so 30 years of experience in the field wasn't interesting to mm, the yeah. associate superintendent. He was not interested in that. Um, and yet he wasn't, he did not have distance education experience. Right. And uh, I call it distance education as opposed to distance learning because right. we're on the distance education side of it and the kids are on the distance learning side. But my point was, is that, um, like you said, some kids are conducive to it and some kids aren't. Right. And some parents are conducive to teaching it and sharing it and, and supervising it, and some parents are not. Yeah, exactly. And your point in that uh, there were a lot of kids that need the interactive relationship with an educator that has educational training. And my point with them was that, oh, you can throw all the kids out of the classroom, but not all of them are going to be able to be, learn and be successful. And in some districts, a thousand kids are missing. A thousand yeah. kids have totally disappeared and have no supervision. They're not online. They're not participating. They don't know where they are. They go out and check the, the homes. They're not there. They have no technology and they have no internet access. Right. And where are they? Well, they don't have parents. There's no supervision. The parents are not there and the kids are not there. And they're not able to learn by technology because they have no bandwidth and they have no computers. And so, but they're not able to sit there and learn by technology. And you know, as well as I do, that we have kids that learn by seeing, by doing, by hearing, and some that need all three. And uh, I'm an experiential learner. I have to have all four. <laughs> and you know, some people can just sit there and listen to a sermon and some people can't sit and listen to a sermon. And uh, others have to read their Bible. And uh, some have to actually get out there and participate in society. And, right. and can't sit and listen to a sermon or read their Bible. So that's the same way in the classroom. Um, yeah. So just sitting there watching an experiment in a classroom on Zoom is, is not going to be able to cut it. Right. right. You know, one of the things this district did also was... Uh, when the pandemic hit and uh, talking about kids that may not have access and those types of things, we had buses sent to certain areas with mobile Wi-Fi units. And the parents were aware that that bus would be there for a two or three hour period. They could show up, the students could log in and work on assignments for those that didn't have access. The district has now come along with even mobile Wi-Fi units available for students who don't have access at home. So all of our kids uh, have devices, not only laptops, but they, if they do not have ac or, uh, access at home, we're providing that for them through the district. So that's been something that I think we've been cutting edge on. 
I just I have, have, to, I have to compliment you, Mr. Graviel. Um, Wildwood has a history, and certainly in your years in charge over there, of meeting the needs of your community. And, and I really commend you for the outreach that you've done to make sure, to the extent possible, that kids aren't falling through the cracks. Yeah. Well you. done. Thank you. Good people I around me. I'm, I'm yes. sorry. It's, my apologies, I came in a little bit late. Um, I'm an online college instructor, and I'm just kind of curious, what kind of online platform are you using? Good question. Ours is through Teams. Uh-huh. And uh, it's set up through Teams Sumter. Uh, assignments are turned in. We All of our kids and uh, teachers have access to OneNote. So assignments were submitted through OneNote and those types of things. Okay, thanks. Sounds like you're doing a great job. Uh, Thank you. Some profound challenges. So well done, sir. Thank you. Can I ask another question, Karen? Is that okay? Oh, yes. Um, I was hearing on, on the news the other day, the education dean, I'm thinking from Princeton or Harvard, was talking about um, children who were already behind, potentially kids who, who may have been in special ed or um, on the cusp, as it were could be expected to lose maybe nine months worth of, of instruction value as a result of, of this pandemic thing. That's a, that's a school year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I try to envision what that's gonna look like when kids get back to school. We know that in any given grade, there's a distribution of performances and, and levels of functioning. But if you've now got, for example, seventh graders, some of whom are functioning on a fifth grade level after all of this, how does, how does the school deal with that grade level assignment, um, continuing to meet the individual learning needs of the students when the, the differences in any given classroom may be even more dramatic than they were before. Um, I, I'm, it may not be an issue for you at Wildwood, but as an educator, could you kind of talk about how schools might deal with that? Because I see it as a huge issue when everyone's back in school. Well, I think it, it's we do constant progress monitoring, uh, diagnostic testing through language arts and math, uh, knowing where our kids are, uh, knowing where we need to get them to, providing remediation and having a pl plan in place uh, for those kids, uh, each teacher. We have a big MTSS program, that's multi-tier system of support here at school that doesn't just deal with uh, disciplined kids, but kids that may be falling behind and in the cracks to where we meet on those, we discuss them, we're able to provide uh, interventions and things to help them along the way as best we can. I can't say that we're going to be perfect with every kid, but we, we try not to let anybody slip through the cracks. And uh, uh, sometimes within this system, we found that maybe a kid was in there too long before we got them the type of help or testing that they needed further. Uh, you know, maybe we needed to have them placed into an ESE or alternative setting some way, and we, we missed that, and we're trying to eliminate that and do the best we can. But uh, it's been even tougher now, and it's, uh, like I said, we've got more of our kids back than probably most schools do. It's something we've really stressed and maybe it's uh, the area that we live and the type of uh, background that these kids have. They, they want to be in school. This is their world and uh, athletics and, and things and community here. So. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Larry. Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Larry. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I seem to recall, uh, years past that um, Wildwood High School has sent uh, students to RILA. Am I right about that? Sent students Rotary where? Youth leadership. Tell, tell them what RILA is. You might not know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy. Um, does that ring a bell? This is only my second year as principal. Okay. So okay. not with me. Uh, and I lost my high school guidance counselor last week. So I'm sure she may have been involved with it in the past. And I'm trying to get right now. We've got some temporary fill-ins coming each day to help us. Um, that's been something else I've had to face, but I'm not familiar with it, but would definitely be interested in meeting with someone and, and getting some of these kids in that. Right. Um, in fact, um, my uh, daughter, who uh, at the time was in Leesburg High School, um, she um, got a ride uh, down to her Rila, Rila um, session, and she met other students from... Um, from Wildwood at Wildwood High School, and so she got her ride there and used to ride there, and they all drove down together. Um, but Rotary has some of the most outstanding youth programs anywhere. Um, in fact, Karen is a graduate of um, the Youth Exchange, where she she got sent to Europe. Was it Karen? Yeah, yeah Germany. Yeah, I was a high school uh, Rotary Exchange student uh, to Germany uh, when I was in high school. So that that's how I first became involved with Rotary. Uh, through that high school program. Just an announcement one day over the loudspeaker at my high school, if you want to go abroad for a year, talk to the guidance counselor, you know, and that's how it all started <laughs> for me with right. Rotary. I'd never heard of Rotary before that, but yeah, definitely very powerful programs, these youth programs through Rotary. Yeah, yeah and uh, my daughter not, not only did Ryla, but she did uh, Rotary Youth Exchange as well. Uh, they have Interact, which is a, um, a high school Rotary uh, sponsored club. In fact, uh, the Leesburg High School currently, um, even though that the, the um, Interact Club doesn't meet because of COVID, they're still doing a virtual city on the moon. And one of the Rotarians um, has worked out an agreement with NASA to send uh, computer chips up with the kids' names that'll be placed on the moon. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's a fantastic program and the kids are just really excited about it. Um, oh, we'd definitely be interested in hearing more if you guys want to come by sometime. and. Uh, sure. Just give us a call and come by anytime, you know? Absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, um, the, in fact, the um, district governor elect, the one who's going to take over, wants to um, revamp um, the, one of his goals is to um, come out with, with a really strong youth exchange program and um, youth programs in general, because COVID has kind of dampened that down. Right. But he's going he's, he's to reemphasize that. So we'd be glad to, to send that your way. Yes, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Wonderful. Um, you, yeah. Mr. Gray, Bill, you'd be interested that most of the people on this call today are educators. We are, are either um, educators at the college level or educators uh, or have been educators at the lower level, but most of us are professors. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. What, is there anything else, um, uh, Mr. Graybill, that you'd like to share with us today? Or does anyone else have questions? I've probably thrown out too much. but <laughs> Not at all. No, thank you. This has been very illuminating for us. And it really is, uh, you know, humbling to, to hear about the challenges you're facing. And, and, and I think all of us are pleasantly surprised at the uh, wonderful uh, ways you've been able to meet the challenges uh, at your school. So thank you so much for coming today and sharing with us. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Stop by and see us.